For those who were to be imprisoned there, Buchenwald was hell on earth. Paradoxically, it was located within the jurisdiction of a town that for some was a heaven on earth, particularly for those attracted there by love of all things German. This was Weimar, a town that could lay claim to be the cultural center of Germany. Weimar, with a current population of 65,000, is located geographically in the heart of Germany. It is also close to the heart of Germany culturally. It has been home to some of the greatest citizens of the German nation. And between 1937 and 1945, Weimar was also home to hundreds of thousands in the camp of Buchenwald, eight kilometers from the town center. Weimar's records stretch back to the year AD 899, but its key role in the development of German art can be dated back to the time of the Reformation. Since then, it has provided home to some of the most illustrious names in German music, painting, literature and architecture, giving it an artistic status that many capital cities of Europe might envy. Over the centuries, its citizens have included such illustrious men as the great Reformation artist Lucas Cranach the Elder and Johann Sebastian Bach and Martin Luther. Later, it would attract such composers as Berlioz, Wagner, Liszt and Richard Strauss and philosophers Schopenhauer and Nietzsche. In the 20th century, Weimar was the first home of the Bauhaus, the Bildhaus movement, that radically simplified forms and emphasized rationality and functionality. One of its aims was to create works of art that could be mass-produced and so allow art to form an intrinsic part of the common life. Its influence on design is seen throughout the modern world. Founded by Walter Gropius, a Jew, in 1919, in 1934 he had to flee to England in fear of his life as the Nazi stranglehold on the Jewish community tightened. 1919 also gave birth to the Weimar Republic. The new republic would become an immediate target of hate for these very rioters, the disaffected and unemployed soldiers, the nationalists, the monarchists and the communists. The Weimar Republic over the years has become a symbol of democracy, weak and decadent, a world of nightclubs with epicene creatures and bizarre sexual tastes in which everything is permissible except moral standards. In fact, as a democracy, it survived remarkably well, given that it consisted of numerous interests all pulling in different directions with a whole series of daunting problems to be faced. The constitution it drafted is in many ways a model for democracy, but it possessed one fatal flaw. Constitutionalists were only too aware of the tensions created by the extremists, both left and right, and feared that in a time of national emergency, stalemate caused by these two opposing forces might leave Germany incapable of action. To prevent this happening, they inserted a clause that, should such an emergency arise, all power would pass to the Chancellor. This was the clause that would ultimately allow Hitler to seize power, claiming the burning of the Reichstag building had created such a state, and it has banned all political parties other than the National Socialists. While the politicians had drawn up what they thought was a blueprint for a democratic Germany, the citizens of Weimar may have found considerable satisfaction in finding Hitler had given himself limitless powers. They had always supported the Nazis, and in 1933 more than half of their electorate had voted for him, and the first government posts to be held by the party were here. By the time of the death of the Weimar Republic, the city's golden age had long since come and gone. It had lasted from the arrival in 1775 of Germany's greatest literary genius, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, until his death in 1832. 
During his residence in this house, which has become a shrine, the intelligentsia and artistic community were attracted to Weimar to pay homage, not least Friedrich Schiller, who in 1794 wrote to Goethe offering him his friendship. The town of Weimar was thus supported by the twin pillars of the Romantic movement. It is said that Schiller's stay was relatively brief, a mere six years, but in this period his powers were at their peak and together with Goethe founded the Weimar Theatre, leading to a new dawn for German theatre. The building they had erected would be the meeting place of the Weimar Constitutionalists and, ironically, the womb of the Third Reich. As for Goethe, many of his major works were written during his long stay in this beautiful town in Thuringia, with its backdrop of forested hills. Without doubt, the most important of these, and one of the essential works of world literature, is Faust, the story of the man who sells his soul to the devil. Noted for his love of natural beauty, Goethe would frequently wander to the Ettersberg in search of inspiration. This is a tree-covered hill that rises 1,568 feet to the north of the town of Weimar. There was a particular spot where he loved to sit and rest, contemplate the world below, and plan out his next masterpiece. His association with the tree became so well known that it was given the name of Goethe's Oak. It was around this oak that in 1937 the camp of Buchenwald was built. It is said that the SS hanged people with their arms twisted behind their back from this tree. That does not appear to have been the case. They had too much sentimental respect for the culture of the fatherland, and there were many other trees around. Preliminary approaches for a base for the SS at Weimar were made by the Thuringia Gorleiter, Fritz Saukel, the son of a postman and a seamstress. A Gauleiter held a high rank within the Nazi party. The country had been divided up into 32 districts or Gau, a medieval word that the Romantic National Socialist Party had reintroduced to the language, and a Gauleiter was the leader of the Gau, or the chief functionary within the area. Theoretically, functionaries whose purpose was merely to coordinate party activities within their district, they were in fact unquestioned leaders of their regions. The Gauleiter was second only to the Reichsleiters, or empire leaders, composed of such eminences as Göring, Goebbels and Himmler. Naturally enough, the Reichsleiter approached by Saukel in this case was Heinrich Himmler, who gave the subject due consideration and came back to the Gauleiter with the welcome news that he had decided to place a concentration camp in the vicinity. Weimar's loyalty was already being recognized by the erection of government offices in the town, and this was yet another example of the party's favor. Saukel expressed his complete satisfaction with the outcome. Whilst retaining the position of Gauleiter, Saukel was to be appointed in 1942 as head of labor deployment and was in charge of bringing five million slave laborers from occupied territory into Germany. Accused at Nuremberg of crimes against humanity, he denied that his labor deployment role had, in his words, anything to do with exploitation. It is an economic process to supply labor. His last words before being hanged were, It is unjust. I die innocent. God protect Germany. His superior, and the man who appointed him, was Albert Speer, who escaped the noose. Buchenwald was one of the first of the new larger purpose-built concentration camps which came into being in 1937. By the end of that year, only three other concentration camps were left in existence. The SS or Schutzstaffel, the Shield Squad, were carrying out a policy of creating order out of the sprawl of small camps that had been flung together as Hitler assumed power when he took over the German Chancellorship in 1933. The original camps, known as wild camps, were created from abandoned factories, ruined castles, or were simply areas of wasteland enclosed with barbed wire. 
In Berlin, the notorious Columbia House, an adapted 19th century military complex, served this purpose. These camps were run by the SA, or Sturmabeitlung, the stormtroopers, a body of men formed from street fighters and brawlers whose practices were notoriously corrupt. One of their first victims was the head of the Communist Party, Ernst Talman. He describes his treatment. They brutally assaulted me, and in the process knocked four teeth out of my jaw. This proved unsuccessful. They tried hypnosis, which was likewise totally ineffective. The high point of the drama was the final act. They ordered me to take off my pants, and then two men grabbed me by the back of the neck and placed me across a footstool. A uniformed officer with a whip of hippopotamus hide then beat me across my buttocks with measured strokes. Driven wild with pain, I screamed at the top of my voice. He goes on to say how, after further beatings and kickings, he was already so exhausted and my heart so strained it nearly took my breath away. Talman had started his political career as social democrat, but turned to communism. Following the instructions of Stalin, he ignored the threat of the far right and fixed his attention on attacking his former allies in the Social Democratic Party. This split the political left, and the resulting elections brought in the Nazis. Talman rapidly had to pay the price for Stalin's misjudgment and ended his days in Buchenwald. In 1934, the leaders of the SA were massacred on Hitler's instructions. This had nothing to do with their brutality, but with the size and power of their organization. With three million recruits, it had become a threat both to the Nazi party and the army. From now on, only the SS would be in charge of the camps. They were prepared for the task. Since 1933, on the Führer's instructions, Heinrich Himmler had been involved in plans for centralizing the detention system. Theodor Eicher, who had been in charge of the camp at Dachau since June 1933, was now named inspector of the camps. Himmler, in making his appointment, freed Eicher from any control by either the Gestapo or the SD, the Sicherheitsdienst, the SS security police and in detaching the camps from the normal instruments of control, conferred on their commandants enormous power. Eicher was a fanatical anti-Bolshevik, an anti-Semite, and a severe disciplinarian. For all this, his lack of pretensions, his ability to mix with his own men at their level, and his personal courage commanded the respect of his staff. In 1935, Dachau was chosen to be the site for training a new body of men which would include those appointed to camp command. The unit, which was independent of any other body of the SS, was given its name in 1936, the Totenkopfverbande, or Death's Head Force. It was here that Karl Koch, the first commander of Buchenwald, received his training. The men Eicher chose had to pass strict tests for physical fitness and racial purity. They were put through harsh physical training lasting from dawn till dusk, a routine only relieved by camp duty, which could include the maltreatment of prisoners. Most of the early prisoners were political, and communists were regarded by Eicher as an inferior category of humanity and the enemies of the Reich. To understand Buchenwald, it is important to note that it was not set up as and never became an extermination camp. Its purpose was to confine and intimidate all that the Reich considered its natural enemies. The commandant of Auschwitz, Rudolf Hoss, who was trained at Dachau, stated that under Reich's supervision, the guards developed a hate and antipathy towards prisoners that is inconceivable to the outside world. There, behind the barbed wire, lurks the enemy, and he watches everything you do. Show these enemies of the state your teeth. Anyone who shows even the smallest sign of compassion for enemies of the state must disappear from our ranks. 
I can only use hard men who are determined to do anything. According to his regulations, prisoners were to be hanged for anything that could be interpreted as political activity, which included anyone who forms cliques, loiters around with others, collects true or false information about the concentration camp, receives such information, or talks about it to others. Prisoners were to be shot on the spot or hanged for refusing to obey an order. An SS man tempted to show leniency might be stripped of his rank and thrown into the camp as a prisoner. Any slight infraction of any regulation was liable to punishment. Karl Koch passed through this training successfully. By the time he arrived at Buchenwald, he had already reigned over the dreaded Columbia House where he had trained the prisoners to bark as he passed by. He had gone to earn the reputation of being the most brutal of all camp commanders. Within a month of his arrival, a 23-year-old labourer, Hermann Kepek, was found hanged. His was the first death to take place in the camp. The camp Koch arrived at in 1937, together with his bride Ilse, was still in the course of construction. It had recently received the name Buchenwald, or Beechwood, after complaints were made about its previous name, Ettersburg. The name Ettersburg was too closely associated with that of Weimar for the comfort of its citizens. On July the 19th, 1937, an advanced squad of 149 convicts had arrived at Ettersburg from Sachsenhausen, where they were joined the next day by a further 70. By August the 6th, 1,400 prisoners were on site, a mix of convicts identified by their green badges, political prisoners wearing red, and Jehovah's Witnesses wearing purple. They came to a site which consisted of 75 hectares of woodland, it had been chosen in line with the normal SS criteria, wild enough to impede any attempts to escape, but close enough to civilization to allow easy access to communication centers, supplies and social activities. The former prisoner Eugen Kogan would write, The choice of the site was highly symbolic. Weimar, the national center of German culture, and Buchenwald, a raw piece of land on which the new German emotion was to flower. Together, a sentimentally cultivated museum culture and the unscrupulous, brutal will for power thus created the typical new connection, Weimar Buchenwald. The literal connection was the road from the camp to Weimar, and the inmates had to lug heavy stones frequently by hand from the quarry to the construction area. The number of casualties that occurred during this process gave the new highway a name used by the prisoners, Blutstrasse, or Blood Road. It connected with the main entry into the camp, the Karachoveg, or Caracho Path. It is thought to have gained its name from the Spanish word Caracho, referring to a place of misery, originally the top mast of a sailing ship. This was the road along which new arrivals attempted to complete their entry to the camp, speeded along by the blows and jeers of the SS. To create the camp itself, the prisoner's first task was to clear the forest, sparing only Goethe's oak. Various work details were formed for logging, excavation, barrack construction and so on, which worked a 14-hour day including Sundays, starting at 6 in the morning and continuing to 8 or 9 in the evening. There was a one-hour lunch break, which was mainly taken up by assembling for a double roll call, double to make certain that none had escaped. Latrine pits were dug and furnished with poles to fit up to 15 men at a time. The SS were liable to appear at any time and amuse themselves by flinging those unfortunate enough not to have got away in time into the cesspool. Regular beatings were administered. In the course of the construction, a prisoner collapsed through exhaustion and was unable to rise. The officer in command of construction ordered that, if he was unable to get up, then he should remain where he was. He froze to death. This was SS Captain Weissenborn, of whom the SS themselves said that God in his wrath had created him. 
What he was in charge of constructing was considerably more ambitious than what is normally thought of as a concentration camp, the fenced-in prisoners encampment. That took up a relatively small part of the whole site. It was enclosed by a 380 volt electrically charged barbed wire fence, three meters in height, three kilometers in length, with watchtowers placed every 250 feet. Apart from the watchtower lights, the fence was further lit at regular intervals. There was a security strip of sand within it with trip wires. Any prisoner found inside the strip would be shot. On only one occasion did a prisoner enter it voluntarily and so commit suicide. But others did die there. Some would be beaten into it by a sadistic guard or have their hat thrown in and be instructed to collect it. In all events, they were shot dead. At the entrance of the camp was the gatehouse with a tower which bore a large clock and carried floodlights capable of lighting up the whole camp. The motif on the gate, Yeda da Saina, or to each his own, was written so that the message was legible from within the camp rather than without. This was on the instructions of the first commandant, Karl Koch, to ensure that no inmate would ever forget it. On one flank of the gatehouse were offices, and on the other, the camp prison cells. These that gained the name The Bunker received their first prisoners in February 1938. Under Martin Sommer, the hangman of Buchenwald, this would become the center for torture and execution. It was he who claimed to invented the punishment called tree hanging, which was to be widely used in the camps. One of the inmates described how he was forced to build a pile of bricks, then it his arms raised and tied together around the tree trunk behind his back. The bricks were then kicked away. The pain I felt on my arms and shoulders was indescribable. I tried to find something on the tree trunk to prop my feet on, but all my efforts were for naught. I kept sliding farther downwards, which made the pain worse. When I came to, I was lying on the ground being kicked by boots. The SS scoundrel cried, Get to work! I gathered all my strength and dragged myself away. I could no longer move my hands forward. In the bunker, Martin Sumner was left free to carry out his punishments. He would torture his unfortunate victims with beatings or by hanging them from the bars of the cell. One punishment was to stand stock still in the cell from five o'clock in the morning till ten o'clock at night. Any observed motion warranted a beating. This would be 25 strokes with a horsehair whip filled with steel. Being caught looking out of the window could result in instant death. Exercises to the point of exhaustion would be carried out in the cell corridors. At the point of collapse, Sommer would delight in kicking the exhausted man in the head till blood flowed from his orifices. He took such pleasure in killing that he offered to pay the camp doctor to prepare toxic concoctions for him, which he would inject into his victims. Leading to the gatehouse was the Karachu Path, overseen by the command headquarters. This was the heart of the administration of the camp, and where the commandant had his office. Facing it were the Gestapo offices, where the independent security police would carry out their own interrogations. Behind the gatehouse was the Appelplatz, or roll call area, a place that the prisoners would come to dread. It was a dust bowl in summer and a quagmire in winter. In winter, the temperature could fall to 22 degrees below zero at night. Year after a hard day's work, the prisoners would have to stand for hours on end. The camp had initially been built to house 8,000, but by the end, 50,000 men were crammed into it. A mistake in the tally would mean all those men needed to be recounted. Even in the early years, the roll call area would be used as a simple means of mass punishment. In December 1938, two prisoners escaped. As a result, on the grounds that the roll call had not been completed, 
the whole camp had to remain at attention for 19 hours. The prisoner's clothing was threadbare and the temperature fell to five degrees below zero. By noon the next day, 70 men had died. War came as a relief. With a blackout, it was no longer advisable to retain the men together in conditions of total darkness. The SS had good reason to believe that they themselves might not survive the night. After roll call was over, members of the Jewish community would sometimes be retained to sing time after time a song that had been composed specifically for this purpose. It began, For years we wreaked deceit upon the nation. No fraud too great for us, no scheme too dark. All that we did was cheat and lie and swindle, whether with dollar or with pound or mark. It continued in the same vein, becoming increasingly scurrilous. In May 1938, the SS had introduced a subgroup Jews to all its categories. From then on, criminals who were Jewish would wear a green badge together with a yellow star, Political prisoners, a red badge with a yellow star, and so on. Even the dying and dead would attend the roll call, the dead being dragged onto the square before being sent to the mortuary in the crematorium. Only those in the hospital were spared the agony, or inmates on permanent detail. Being on permanent detail was no soft option, nevertheless. Special details were formed from those who had committed offences against the camp regulations and after receiving their punishments. They would work from sunup to sundown without respite, including Sundays, very often on half rations. They would perform hard labour in the quarry or elsewhere and were worked to death. Behind the apple plats were the quarters, a mix of one-storey wooden and two-storey brick barracks. The wooden barracks had two wings and the brick four. Each wing was to provide accommodation for between one and two hundred prisoners. The bunks for sleeping were arranged in tiers with straw mattresses later covered with sheets. Between each wing there might be an open latrine and a washroom together with a day room with lockers where prisoners kept their only possessions, a mess kit, a canteen cup and a spoon. Here they might spend the evening, enjoying what little time and freedom they had, or they might pass it strolling through the unmade paths between the barracks. At night they were only permitted to wear shirts, even when the interior of the sleeping quarters were covered with ice. The torments of the roll call might extend further into the evening, in the form of dreaded barrack searches. At his worst, this would entail an orgy of destruction carried out by the SS, as in June 1938 when they came in and smashed windows, tore off windowsills and cut up 200 of the straw sacks that served as bedding. Three Jews died on this day. It was up to the prisoners to make all good in their own time and a threat of further punishment. The normal punishment for a slovenly made bed was 25 lashes with a horse hair and iron whip. Within the prisoner's compound were the dental clinic, the convalescent clinic and the terrifying experimental ward 46, as well as the regular wards. In 1940 there existed a permanent crematory consisting of the morgue, the post-mortem rooms, two combustion chambers and staff quarters. Prior to this the dead had been burnt in the crematorium at Weimar, 48 in 1937, 771 in 1938, of which 408 were Jews, and 1,235 in 1939. A hospital had been erected at the same time as the prisoners' quarters. That it was not thought of in terms of the prisoners' welfare is obvious from an SS note in 1938 that confirms that requests had been made for two further castrations to take place. The building of their own barracks was a luxury that the pioneering workforce was not to know for a period of time. The SS officers and guards' quarters had first to be built. In the meantime, the slave workers would sleep where they could through the deadly cold of a Thuringia winter. 
The officers' houses were built on the south slopes of the Ettersberg, where the weather was milder. They were constructed along an asphalt road laid by the prisoners. There were finally ten luxurious villas constructed, none more so than that built for the camp commander and his wife, Karl and Isa Koch. So palatial did the wooden Gothic construction appear to her that she spent pages of a photographic album recording it, leaving behind a testament to what SS tastes could command when no expense was spared. Behind the barracks were the kennels. As conditions in the camp deteriorated, the dogs would be housed far better than the prisoners. They were always better treated. There were police dogs, trained to attack men in striped clothing. They were used not only in the camp, where setting them on a prisoner was one form of amusement that also served as a punishment. They were also used on outside details, on railway and road building and quarry work. There were also bloodhounds and tracker dogs. There were other residences beyond the barbed wire, a mix of small houses and well-equipped barracks. This is where the famous and wealthy who had fallen foul of the Nazi party would be housed. Spreading out from these in a semicircle and splitting them off from the main compound were the quarters of the SS guards. Installed in his new home, Commandant Koch would frequently make time to greet some of the new arrivals. On the apple plats, with the latest dead still laid out on the grounds, he welcomed a new batch of political prisoners with the following words. Those of you who can't march straight will be shot. Look at those pigs in their coffins. That's what's going to happen to you, you bunch of dirty red bastards. Pastor Paul Schneider was an early entrant in the new camp. Karl Koch and his wife had arrived in July 1937, and the pastor was condemned to Buchenwald in November of that year. His crime had been to preach against National Socialism. He was a member of the Confessing Church that opposed Socialism, and he ensured that any member of his church who became a Nazi was excommunicated. In the same year that he arrived in Buchenwald, he had already served a short term in jail, being warned on his release what the consequences would be if he returned to his ministry. In July 1939, he was murdered with a shot of strophanthin by his jailer, Martin Sommer. He was the first Protestant minister to be martyred in the camps for his faith. More than one version of his death went into circulation. In the first two years of the camp's existence, the main work carried out was construction and quarry work. By May 1938, the water supply situation had become dire, and Commandant Koch ordered that the prisoners should receive no more than four buckets per barrack. Thirst was to be the perpetual companion of the inmates for the remainder of the construction period. Overseeing them in January 1938 were 1,262 guards who could comfortably look after the 2,633 prisoners consigned to them. By December, the decreasing ratio of guards to prisoners was a harbinger of things to come. From one guard being available for every two prisoners, 2,176 guards had now to manage 9,172 or one guard to more than four prisoners. As time went on, the ratio would continue to deteriorate. The camps would have become ungovernable, but for the cooperation of key members of the prison community, the capos. What guards there were soon ceased to be Eicher's elite, and were made up from the wounded of the Waffen-SS, the fighting arm of the SS, and the Luftwaffe. Of course, the camps did become increasingly ungovernable, but in 1938 it was a proud boast to be one of the Totenkopferbande, and men were happy to sign on for 4 to 11 years. Records exist of punishments administered on the block or flogging stand in the first half of 1938. 241 inmates received the standard punishment normally administered by Martin Sommer, the bunker boss. 
The block's function was to hold a man immobile whilst he received his whipping. The punishment was carried out on the apple plats during evening roll call to ensure the maximum humiliation. Five to twenty-five lashes were administered, the number sometimes being raised arbitrarily during the punishment. They were administered on the victim's bare buttocks in front of the whole camp to ensure the greatest possible humiliation. The open wounds they created would take weeks to heal. The figures for the first half of the year indicate that roughly 500 prisoners became personally acquainted with the flogging stand in just one year, out of a total population at that time of roughly 8,000. In June 1938, the first prisoner to be executed in a concentration camp was hanged before the assembly in the Appleplatz. He was hanged using a portable gallows, a rudimentary construction that could be put away, leaving little evidence of its use within the camp. In fact, public execution was unusual in Buchenwald, although it was carried out frequently in subcamps such as Dora. This gallows, which could fit ten bodies, was taken outside the camp on one particularly notorious occasion, where it served with two others, one a single gallows and another with ten hooks in a mass execution. On April the 26th, 1942, a Polish forced labourer on outside detail was beaten unconscious by a German policeman. Two Poles took revenge and stabbed him to death on a forest path. One of the two Poles, Jan Sovka, was apprehended shortly after his escape. On May the 11th, 1942, 19 prisoners from Buchenwald were taken to the place in the woods where the policeman's body had been found. The 19 Polish prisoners were positioned behind the gallows and Jan Sovka stood on the opposite side. The prisoners and Jan Sovka were hanged one after another on the single gallows. At the end, all the bodies were transferred to be suspended from the two multiple gallows. Hundreds of Polish forced laborers from the surrounding area were rounded up and forced to watch. Prior to 1940, the crematorium of the town of Weimar was used to carbonize the remains of prisoners, but as the deaths mounted, it was decided there was need of something inside the camp. Once Buchenwald had its own crematorium, the cellar of this charnel house became the main place for execution. The victims were normally prisoners who had escaped from other concentration camps. They would be handed over to the Buchenwald Gestapo, whose office was just outside the prisoner's camp. In a procedure known as special treatment, the Reich Department of Security would impose a death sentence which was carried out here without any sort of legal proceeding. After torture and interrogation, the prisoner would be taken to the cellar where a noose was placed around his neck. He was then lifted onto one of the 48 hooks arranged in a line around the wall. The other end of the rope was tied to the hook and the victim was left to strangle. The doctor would bear witness to the proceedings and would pronounce the prisoner dead at the end of 35 minutes. Hermann Helbig, who took part in the majority of the executions, testified. They were brought down one by one. They presumably saw the others hanging there. As the oppression in the camps worsened, the new commandant was anxious to ensure that his own quality of life improved. A falconry was built on the pretext of it being a gift of Reichsfuhrer Göring. The astonished head of the Luftwaffe accepted it, but never bothered to pay a visit. It's a whim of the Kochs, dedicated to their own amusement and that of their men. It cost 135,000 marks and consisted of the falcon house itself, of carved oak, a hunting hall with hand-carved furniture, and a falconer's house. To it was added a zoological garden, which provided for deer, 
wild boar, wild cats, bears, and even a rhinoceros amongst a number of other animals. If one died, there was a so-called voluntary contribution requested from the Jews to replace it, whilst there were still enough Jews outside the camps to fund such exotic tastes. It was rumoured that the SS amused themselves by throwing prisoners to the bears to be ripped open. Whatever the truth of some of the tales that circulated through the camps, death was ever present. And it was now becoming obvious that the prisoners were to die in large numbers. In February of 1939, the first typhus epidemic broke out due to the unhygienic conditions that prevailed in the camps. To take just one example, the prisoners might be confined to barracks and reduced to defecating in their own mess tins. The water drought continued. Poor nutrition was also a major problem. By September, the daily rations for the Jews were reduced to 400 grams of bread a day and a litre of watery soup. With the coming of the war, the camp expanded. Part of the roll call area was used for the first of a series of little camps, some temporary and some permanent. They were fenced off from the rest of the camp with barbed wire. This area included a cage known as the Rose Garden. A grim joke. It was nothing but a barbed wire cage where recalcitrant prisoners were left to starve or freeze to death. The first guests to this new extension of the camp were 110 Poles who would die of cold and hunger a matter of weeks after their arrival. Thousands of new arrivals poured into the camps, a mix of Czechs, Poles, Viennese Jews and Gypsies. By the time the first of these special camps was closed in 1940, half of its occupants had died of cold, hunger or disease. The Jehovah's Witnesses who had formed part of the advance guard had somewhat better treatment. They formed an anti-political group, clinging to an unworldly neutrality whereby they would neither offer support nor rejection. For them, the political world was an irrelevance in comparison to the forthcoming judgment. And during the early 40s, their church taught that the Nazis would unleash the apocalypse. They shunned political meetings and refused to allow their children to join Hitler Youth. Of 20,000 witnesses active during the Nazi era, about half spent some time in a camp, the normal sentence averaging 18 months. With the outbreak of war in September 1939, the first officer in charge, Arthur Rodel, called them to the Appleplatz with the following message. You know that war has broken out and that the German nation is in danger. If any of you refuses to fight, all of you must die. Not a single one volunteered for service. An assault by the SS Guard made no difference. They were assigned to the quarry and refused hospital treatment. In time, those who survived returned to their usual duties. Due to their willingness to follow orders and their lack of interest in escaping, they frequently served the SS in the role of domestics. The fact that they generally received more lenient treatment should not obscure the fact that across the camp network, 250 witnesses were hanged, usually for having refused to perform military service. In November 1939, an attempt was made on Hitler's life in Munich. Every year on the same date, Hitler would visit this favoured city and talk to the faithful. On this particular day, with impeccable timing, the Führer cut his speech short and saved himself by a hair's breadth from assassination. Others were not so fortunate. The attempt had been carried out by a lone operator, Johann Hesler, a passionate trade unionist who had grown increasingly concerned by the Nazis' tightening grip on the labour movements. He would end his days in Dachau. Despite the fact there was no Jewish connection, the SS in Buchenwald determined that Jews and their power should pay the price. Twenty-one Jews were taken to the quarry and shot by an execution unit.
Conditions in the little camps were even harsher than in the main camp, and towards the end of the war they were used to segregate the Jews, frequently suffering from typhoid, together with any other transients suffering the same disease from the rest of the establishment. The Kochs continued to mould the camps into something nearer their heart's desires in the year of 1940, when Ilsa had a riding area built for herself. The hall was around 120 by 300 feet and 60 feet in height. Its walls were furnished with mirrors, and it was built with such speed that 30 prisoners died during its construction, either from accidents or through fatigue. Commandant's wife would ride around it several times a week, with the SS band playing appropriate accompanying music from a bandstand. Her newfound interest in riding may have had something to do with the Koch's acquaintance with the Prince Josias of Valdeck and Piermont, an enthusiastic rider and student of form. Whether this was so or not, the relationship form was to cost the Koch's dearly. His family had lost their principality during the Weimar Republic and he had joined the Nazi party and the SS at the end of the 20s, rapidly becoming Himmler's adjutant. He was Gestapo chief of Weimar, with Buchenwald coming under his jurisdiction. He took an instant dislike to Karl Koch. During 1940, the SS purchased a number of small industrial plants that had been set up in the camp for various activities, mainly related to the now almost completed construction. These were brought from the Reich, which owned the camps and all their resources, but the SS had interested itself in using them to expand its burgeoning industrial empire. Profits generated were to be ploughed back into the camps to make them self-sufficient, as well as for the development of the SS itself. The activities were consolidated, and an area of the camp became a branch of the Deutsche Ausrustenwerke, known as the DAW, or German Equipment Works. It was to become essentially a small arms factory and the source of considerable revenue. The first Soviet prisoners to arrive were shot here. Further Soviet prisoners arrived in the course of the year and in 1940 the stables that had been built for the Commandant's wife were put to a further use the extermination of the Soviet prisoners. Buchenwald was not a death camp kitted out for the mass slaughter of certain groups of peoples, and the practice that developed with regard to the Soviets had a degree of amateur theatricality. Part of the stables was transformed into a waiting room, with the SS dressed up in white coats. A prisoner was examined in a perfunctory way and pronounced fit, and sent on into a further room to his height and weight taken. He was lined up against a measure on the wall with his back to it. The wall had been pierced, and an execution on the other side would shoot his victim in the back of the neck. The floor was washed down, and the next prisoner of war invited in. Throughout, loud music would drown out any suspicious sounds. Grotesque as the methodology seems, by the end of the war, 8,000 prisoners, whose deaths do not appear in any of the camp records, had been dealt with in this fashion. Not all the Soviet prisoners were slaughtered. What was taking place was a cleansing operation. Despite the fact that Hitler's aggressive policies had been justified by the need of the German people for Lebensraum, or room in which to live, the extra room was needed for a population that was posited to reach 250 million over the next 100 years. It was becoming apparent that with a population of roughly 80 million, there were not currently sufficient Germans to occupy the conquered territories, and that they would have to use Russians and Ukrainians to recolonize their own lands. This would not be possible if they were still controlled and organized by communist thinkers, 
and the task of the Gestapo had been to identify potential leaders, the officers, commissars, youth leaders and party officials. There was no means for the communist underground to protect these individuals, since they had been identified before arrival at the camp. The remainder of the Soviets were subjected to extremely harsh treatment and were reduced to attempting to feed themselves by eating worms and roots. Any prisoner attempting to relieve their suffering would be subjected to 25 lashes and transferred to the quarries for hard labour. The authorities justified this treatment by referring to the fact that Russia had refused to sign the Geneva Convention. So the SS had come to the conclusion that their own soldiers were being as harshly treated by the Russians. In this, they do not appear to have been totally incorrect. Of more than three and a half million Germans captured by the Soviets, over one million died during their imprisonment. Of 5.7 million Russians taken prisoner by the Germans, 3.3 million were allowed to die. The number of deaths on both sides was appalling. After 1942, the Soviets ceased to create a problem for Buchenwald, as the majority of them were transferred to Sachsenhausen, 4,200 perishing en route. Many bizarre events took place during the existence of the camp, but none more so than the creation of a cinema. One of the SS barracks was deconstructed and moved into the camp area, and Buchenwald could thus claim another first. It was the first camp to offer filmed entertainment, principally for the guards and those prisoners who had been granted privileges. The entrance fee was a trifling 20 pfennigs. Most of the shows consisted of propaganda productions. When films were not being shown, the cinema was a place of punishment. During the evening's entertainment, the whipping rack would be moved to one side, where it would join the portable gallows and posts used for hanging the prisoners by their arms. The war on the Eastern Front was to affect Buchenwald in other ways than the need to provide accommodation, however temporary, for Soviet and Polish prisoners. It required fighting men in huge quantities and enough leaders to put them to use. The renowned father of the concentration camp system, Theodor Eicke, was called eastward as a general of the fighting arm of the SS, the Waffen-SS. With his departure, the Kochs lost their staunchest supporter, and Prince Waldeck, Gestapo head of Weimar, an enemy of Karl Koch, was to make good use of his absence. His first attempt to eliminate Koch was to have the tax authorities examine the camp's records and have the commandant account for millions in unaccounted revenue. Himmler intervened on Koch's behalf, leaving Waldeck outmaneuvered. At the end of the year of 1941, Himmler had Koch transferred to Lublin, his wife Ilse choosing instead to remain behind at a luxurious villa in Buchenwald. In 1943, Prince Waldeck would finally triumph, but by this time the Koch's influence on the affairs of the camps had long ceased. Further scandals accompanied Koch to Lublin, where it was proved that when prisoners escaped, he simply arrested civilians who were under police observance to take their place. For what the SS regarded as being his crimes during his rule at Buchenwald, he would be condemned to death by an SS judge after a trial that dragged on for two years. Prince Waldeck made certain the sentence was carried out by having him shot as the Allied forces advanced in 1945. Ilse Koch was found not guilty after investigation by the SS, but would later face life in prison after being tried by German courts after the war. Most notorious for allegedly having made lampshades out of human skin, a charge which was never proved, she was found guilty of a sufficient number of war crimes to warrant a life sentence. She committed suicide in 1967 while serving a sentence. 
How is it possible for the Kochs to be suspected of having access to this enormous amount of money? The first way of a camp commandant enriching himself was through siphoning off the monthly allowance for feeding the prison population. Small as the allowance was of 55 fennecs per day, taking into account that the prison population at the time of the reign of the Cox was roughly 10,000 inmates, if 15 fennecs were purloined from each, by the end of his years, over half a million marks would have been sequestered. Further funds could be obtained by charging the prisoners with money exorbitant amounts to buy food at the prison canteen, ten times what the same food would cost in the outside world. Over the course of Buchenwald's time under the SS, it is estimated that the total surplus may have been two million marks. Just one black account book of Koch shows that 52,000 marks were paid into it. The Jews were forced to purchase their own mess kits at hugely inflated amounts. New arrivals at the camp were effectively robbed at induction. They were not permitted to hold more than 30 marks and any surplus was confiscated. Any funds a man was sent were confiscated and later divided between the SS and the prisoner. Goods ordered from enterprises in occupied countries were not always paid for. Skilled prisoners were put to work creating expensive gifts or goods for his sale using materials paid for by the state. Later, with slave labour being charged out at four marks a day, the possibility for corruption became immense. Much of the work carried out in the camp factories was created by the motive of personal gain. The motif of the camp was not Arbeit macht frei, or work sets you free, as in the majority of the camps. The inscription on the gate of Buchenwald was Jedem das seine, to each his own. Koch's nephew, Master Sergeant Mikhail, who supplemented his income through sales made in the canteen, adopted this slogan for the amusement of his colleagues. To each his own, and most of it to me. Before Koch's reign was brought to an abrupt end, an underground struggle that had been taking place between the Greens, or convicts, and the political prisoners had been resolved. This was over who should dominate in the Capo organization. The Capo system could be regarded as an extended arm of the SS. It consisted of prisoners who took their orders from their SS masters and enforced them. In doing so, they could help alleviate the brutality ever present in the camp, or seek to reinforce it. For the Greens, there was no moral dilemma in serving the SS. They frequently shared the views of their masters with regard to leftist agitators, Jews and gypsies, and took equal pleasure in causing suffering to their fellow prisoners. The Reds had a more difficult issue that was never properly resolved. By taking control of the capo system, they would be in a position to create an organization that was anti-fascist. But at the same time, in putting together a capo organization that was sufficiently efficient to be acceptable to the SS, they were collaborators. The normal capo was as brutal as his SS masters, taking equal pleasure in brutality and equally eager to profit from his activities, even at a much lower place in the pecking order. Even the Jewish barracks had men who were prepared to lend themselves with relish to these activities. Nor were the Reds immune from this tendency. A Czechoslovakian prisoner named Jaroslav Bard remembers. The capos on the quarry were always brutal killers. Although many of them wore the red triangle of the political inmates, they obeyed the orders of the SS to the letter. Labour in the quarry was carried out under unspeakable conditions, constantly under the rifles of the SS guards, accompanied by the screams and blows of the foremen. There were several accidents every day, and nearly every day at least one inmate was shot to death. Each block came under the control of an SS man, such as Martin Summer. 
Answerable to him was one of the capos, known as the senior block inmate, responsible for maintaining order and distributing rations. The prisoner foremen were in charge of various labour details. Mainly, they consisted of convicts and former stormtroopers, men who enjoyed bullying others and inflicting punishments using clubs and whips. The intern in charge of all the whole camps was the senior camp inmate, the head of the capos, and he would be the man who would issue SS directives to the camp. He was extremely powerful, though his position was perilous in the extreme. Two prisoners who were demoted from his elevated ranks were murdered shortly after by their former masters. It was around this position that the struggle for control took place between the Reds and the Greens. The first senior inmate was Hubert Richter, an ex-stormtrooper and a beast of a man who was first jailed by the SS for covering up a prison escape in order to save his own hide. Reappointed, he made the fatal mistake of attempting to cheat Camp Commandant Koch. Prior to this, Koch had enjoyed playing the Greens off against the Reds, though his sympathies were more with the common convicts than the abhorred communists. This changed after Richter stole the cash donation box from the Jewish part of the camp, containing forced contributions that had been wrung out of the Jews. Karl Koch regarded it as one of his own legitimate perks. Richter was dismissed, together with a number of fellow convicts, and taken to the Black Bunker, a barrack that had been specifically prepared for them. He would never emerge alive from this blacked-out torture chamber. The first political prisoner to hold the top rank was also to face the wrath of the SS and be killed for his involvement in graft, but his appointment had created a precedent. All his successors, bar one, came from the Reds. The political senior camp inmates would use their influence to attempt to have their comrades appointed to positions of power all the way down the line. They in turn would see that the less arduous roles in the camps were reserved for the communists. The roll call office, manned with their personnel, took charge of keeping records, distributing rations and of the roll call itself. The Manpower Utilization Office, which made up the listings for both labor details as well as death camp shipments, was even more powerful. Both these were administered through the capos and formed powerful tools for both good and evil. Names could be scratched from the list of those to be shipped to the death camps, and care was again taken that the communists should be saved. However, the lists had to be filled and for every man saved, another would have to take his place. Transshipment from Buchenwald to other camps took place from 1941. First to Matzausen near Linz, where 389 Dutch Jews were sent to later perish in the quarries, and later in the year, 187 sick and disabled prisoners were sent to be gassed in Sonnerstein. In 1942, 384 Jews were sent to be gassed at a so-called euthanasia facility in Bernsberg, and later in the year, another 405 were sent to Auschwitz. How many names on the lists were substitutes is unknown, but all those on the lists had previously been vetted by the Reds. Influence with the Manpower Utilization Office could also see that your time in the camp could be passed with as little discomfort as possible, given the circumstances or turned into a living hell. Amongst the empowered political prisoners were those who would abuse their positions, preying on their fellow prisoners, those who would be seen strolling through the camp well-dressed, accompanied by a guard dog on a leash. Whatever the flaws in the capo systems operated by the communists, the men who ran it were theoretically put forward by their comrades for their ability to perform a role in an underground movement that provided the camp with up-to-date information regarding the course of the war and thus served as a channel for hope. Whether they were brutal or not was something of a side issue as far as the secret network was concerned. 
They also use their position to squirrel away arms in the event that a moment for a rising should occur. Whatever corruption there was in the Capo system, dominated by groups of men as inflexible as their guards, it is said that other camps ruled by the convicts found Buchenwald's red underground something to envy. Despite this, the rule of the Reds remains a highly controversial subject. This was not enough to prevent a myth being created around them after the end of the war on the division of Germany. Under the Communist German Democratic Republic, for the purposes of Soviet political propaganda, the bitter experience of Buchenwald was turned into a schoolboy's adventure. An exciting tale in which the forces of righteousness are seen to take on an evil empire and emerge victorious. in this beautiful town in Thuringia with its backdrop of forested hills. Without doubt the most important of these and one of the essential works of world literature is Faust, the story of the man who sells his soul to the devil. Noted for his love of natural beauty, Goethe would frequently wander to the Ettersberg in search of inspiration. This is a tree-covered hill that rises 1,568 feet to the north of the town of Weimar. There was a particular spot where he loved to sit and rest, contemplate the world below, and plan out his next masterpiece. His association with the tree became so well known that it was given the name of Goethe's Oak. It was around this oak that in 1937 the camp of Buchenwald was built. It is said that the SS hanged people with their arms twisted behind their back from this tree. That does not appear to have been the case. They had too much sentimental respect for the culture of the fatherland, and there were many other trees around. Preliminary approaches for a base for the SS at Weimar were made by the Thuringia Gorleiter, Fritz Saukel, the son of a postman and a seamstress. A Gauleiter held a high rank within the Nazi party. The country had been divided up into 32 districts or Gau, a medieval word that the Romantic National Socialist Party had reintroduced to the language, and a Gauleiter was the leader of the Gau, or the chief functionary within the area. Theoretically functionaries whose purpose was merely to coordinate party activities within their district, they were in fact unquestioned leaders of their regions. The Gauleiter was second only to the Reichsleiters, or Empire Leaders, composed of such eminences.
For those who were to be imprisoned there, Buchenwald was hell on earth. Paradoxically, it was located within the jurisdiction of a town that for some was a heaven on earth, particularly for those attracted there by love of all things German. This was Weimar, a town that could lay claim to be the cultural center of Germany. Weimar, with a current population of 65,000, is located geographically in the heart of Germany. It is also close to the heart of Germany culturally. It has been home to some of the greatest citizens of the German nation. And between 1937 and 1945, Weimar was also home to hundreds of thousands in the camp of Buchenwald, eight kilometers from the town center. Weimar's records stretch back to the year AD 899, but its key role in the development of German art can be dated back to the time of the Reformation. Since then, it has provided home to some of the most illustrious names in German music, painting, literature and architecture, giving it an artistic status that many capital cities of Europe might envy. Over the centuries, its citizens have included such illustrious men as the great Reformation artist Lucas Cranach the Elder, and Johann Sebastian Bach and Martin Luther. Later, it would attract such composers as Berlioz, Wagner, Liszt and Richard Strauss, and philosophers Schopenhauer and Nietzsche. In the 20th century, Weimar was the first home of the Bauhaus, the Bildhaus movement, that radically simplified forms and emphasized rationality and functionality. One of its aims was to create works of art that could be mass-produced, and so allow art to form an intrinsic part of the common life. Its influence on design is seen throughout the modern world. Founded by Walter Gropius, a Jew, in 1919, in 1934 he had to flee to England in fear of his life as the Nazi stranglehold on the Jewish community tightened. 1919 also gave birth to the Weimar Republic. The new republic would become an immediate target of hate for these very rioters, the disaffected and unemployed soldiers, the nationalists, the monarchists and the communists. The Weimar Republic over the years has become a symbol of democracy, weak and decadent, a world of nightclubs with epicene creatures and bizarre sexual tastes in which everything is permissible except moral standards. In fact, as a democracy, it survived remarkably well, given that it consisted of numerous interests all pulling in different directions, with a whole series of daunting problems to be faced. The constitution it drafted is in many ways a model for democracy, but it possessed one fatal flaw. Constitutionalists were only too aware of the tensions created by the extremists, both left and right, and feared that in a time of national emergency, stalemate caused by these two opposing forces might leave Germany incapable of action. This is Goering, Goebbels and Himmler. Naturally enough, the Reichsleiter approached by Saukel in this case was Heinrich Himmler, who gave the subject due consideration and came back to the Gauleiter with the welcome news that he had decided to place a concentration camp in the vicinity. Weimar's loyalty was already being recognized by the erection of government offices in the town, and this was yet another example of the party's favor. Saukel expressed his complete satisfaction with the outcome. Whilst retaining the position of Gauleiter, Saukel was to be appointed in 1942 as head of labor deployment and was in charge of bringing five million slave laborers from occupied territory into Germany. Accused at Nuremberg of crimes against humanity, he denied that his labor deployment role had, in his words, anything to do with the exploitation. It is an economic process to supply labor. His last words before being hanged were, It is unjust! I die innocent! 
God protect Germany. His superior and the man who appointed him was Albert Speer, who escaped the noose. Buchenwald was one of the first of the new larger purpose-built concentration camps which came into being in 1937. By the end of that year, only three other concentration camps were left in existence. The SS or Schutzstaffel, the Shield Squad, were carrying out a policy of creating order out of the sprawl of small camps that had been flung together as Hitler assumed power when he took over the German Chancellorship in 1933. The original camps, known as wild camps, were created from abandoned factories, ruined castles, or were simply areas of wastelanding. To prevent this happening, they inserted a clause that, should such an emergency arise, all power would pass to the Chancellor. This was the clause that would ultimately allow Hitler to seize power, claiming the burning of the Reichstag building had created such a state and it has banned all political parties other than the National Socialists. While the politicians had drawn up what they thought was a blueprint for a democratic Germany, the citizens of Weimar may have found considerable satisfaction in finding Hitler had given himself limitless powers. They had always supported the Nazis, and in 1933 more than half of their electorate had voted for him, and the first government posts to be held by the party were here. By the time of the death of the Weimar Republic, the city's golden age had long since come and gone. It had lasted from the arrival in 1775 of Germany's greatest literary genius, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, until his death in 1832. During his residence in this house, which has become a shrine, the intelligentsia and artistic community were attracted to Weimar to pay homage, not least Friedrich Schiller, who in 1794 wrote to Goethe offering him his friendship. The town of Weimar was thus supported by the twin pillars of the Romantic movement. It is said that Schiller's stay was relatively brief, a mere six years, but in this period his powers were at their peak and together with Goethe founded the Weimar Theatre, leading to a new dawn for German theatre. The building they had erected would be the meeting place of the Weimar Constitutionalists and ironically the womb of the Third Reich. As for Goethe, many of his major works were written during his long stay.